Right. Should I start? Yes, ma'am. A very warm good evening to all of you. I am Dr. Divya Pandey. I am Associate Professor at VNC in Safdarjung Hospital and also the Joint Secretary of AOGD. I welcome you all to this very interesting topic of overview of research design, systematic reviews and guideline development for obstetricians and gynecologists. Without much ado, I invite Dr. Achla Batra, ma'am, to give her welcome address. Uh, Madam needs no introduction and everyone knows her for all the good work she has done in the last one year as AOGD president. Uh, Dr. Achla Batra, please. Thank you, Divya. Uh, a very, very warm welcome to all of you in this, like Divya says, very interesting webinar. And this is something, you know, when I started my tenure, I wanted that uh, all our chairpersons should also be involved in this, some kind of research. But unfortunately, COVID has, uh, you know, restricted some of the things. But uh, this initiative, I must say, was taken by Radhika. And when she came up with this idea, I was very happy because I feel that we have so much of material and so much of intellect in Delhi itself, but it is not being utilized to project what we are doing, you know, because people are not aware how to go about it, how to do research, how to collect data, how to review, which is not very difficult, but yes, you have to uh, learn it. And I'm very happy that we have with us Dr. Sunita Mittal, who has always been, you know, talking about research. I remember I learned the forest graph when she taught, you know, long back she took a, uh, in a webinar, she talked about the forest. And uh, we are very, very fortunate to have Dr. Matthews, who is not only a national, but an international figure in research. He is the founder of uh, Cochrane India and Dr. Meena Samant, who is the chairperson of the Foxy Research Committee. And of course, Delhi ke diggaj sab hai, Dr. Manju Puri and Dr. J.B. Sharma. And, uh, you know, Lena, I specifically wanted because I see her, you know, whenever I'm seeing her, though she was my junior in Saftajang, but I have seen her, you know, uh, grow and uh, doing very good work. And Amita Sunija, Asmita, Ashok Kumar, SN Basu, Dr. Vanita Suri, all these people are doing very, very good work, as you all know. And uh, it's very good that in our first, I hope it is first of a series, and we do a series of these uh, uh, webinars. And uh, uh, all these people who've joined us today in our you know, inaugural uh, webinar, uh, I welcome them all specially. And uh, I I know that this is going to be a great uh, success and everybody is going to learn a lot from it. Over to you, Radhika. Yeah, uh, so thank you so much, ma'am. And a uh, very warm, a very warm welcome uh, to all. Uh, respected faculty, uh, my colleagues, dear friends. So this is the first step forward that you know we've been planning for some time. Uh, the point was that uh, we wanted to uh, do uh, something in the direction of not only the primary research, but also in the direction of the secondary research. Everybody, you know, we found in the last year, people were planning so many webinars and most of them had uh, some, uh, you know, uh, time allocated for research designs, publications sort of thing. But nobody really spoke of the secondary uh, research, meaning systematic reviews, or uh, you know, in the direction of guideline development, which I think is today is really the unmet need of our country. So uh, with that in mind, uh, this was the reason we decided to plan this brief CME. And if this is well taken, and if people do agree with us, I think we can take this forward and have some sort of workshops so that we have people who are working in this direction and finally end up having some good guidelines which people are able to uh, you know, uh, acquire and start practicing, which are through auditable standards. So uh, with that, uh, I thank you all for being there, for all the support. And uh, now I invite our chief guest, Dr. Sunita Mittal, uh, to please address the audience. Can I have a slide uh, for introduction, please?
So uh, Dr. Sunita has been there for many, many years in the field of Obzen Gaini. We all know her. We all know the good work that she's done. And uh, she is the director and head of the department of Obzen Gaini at the Fortis Memorial Research Institute. And she is a former head of the department and uh, director in charge of uh, WHO CCR, as well as the Human Reproduction and Chief ART IVF facility at Our Lady Institute of Medical Sciences. And she is renowned in the field of Obzen Gaini, having a wide experience of more than 46 years. She's a pioneer to introduce emergency contraception and medical abortion in India. She worked as a professor and head of the department program director in the postpartum program and human reproduction research center at ICMR Ames and uh, at New Delhi. And uh, she's been at Ames for more than 30 years and she's been the director in charge of WHO CCR in human reproduction and Ames. Uh, she initiated the IVF facility and ERT center at Ames and uh, established the Advanced uh, Endoscopy uh, Training Center under the Women's Health Initiative at AIMS. So she has special expertise in infertility and reproductive endocrinology, and she's a consultant on reproductive health issues for WHO and UNFPA, and recipient of several awards and gold medals. So this is just the gist of uh, all the work that she has done. So Madam, it's our honor and privilege to have you here to be you know, supporting us with your presence here today. I request you to address the audience uh, before we start the program, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Radhika. Good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, I would like to compliment Dr. Achla, President AOGD, Dr. Radhika, her team, Dr. Divya Pandey, and other members for planning a CME on research, designs, systematic reviews, and guideline development in obstetrics and gynecology. You are going to get a good overview on these topics by Dr. Nina Savant and, of course, she is going to talk about evidence practice in research designing then you will have an overview by Dr. Radhika on steps for systematic review and Dr. Joseph Matthew on process of clinical practical guideline formulations. You, we also have a panel of experts chairing the sessions like Dr. Vinita Suri, Dr. Ashok Kumar, Dr. Leena, Dr. Amita Sumeja, Dr. J.B. Sharma, Dr. Manju Puri, Dr. Asmita Rathor, Dr. S. N. Basu, etc. It is my proud privilege to inaugurate this important meeting, and I am grateful to the organizers for inviting me. The scientific organizations around the world have recognized the need to use more rigorous processes to ensure that healthcare recommendations are dictated by the best available research evidence. And WHO Advisory Committee on Health Research transfers to do work on this. They constantly are trying to achieve the target. The research planning and review is an ongoing process. It is an important that whenever research is designed, it should be with a definitive goal and should have a very high strength good research is conducted so that a good foundation is laid. And here I would also like to say that in India, it's also very important that whatever good research or whatever clinical expertise people have, which is enormous, should also find place in publication. Then only it can make the place take place in guidelines. Because when we were sitting in WHO developing guidelines, we would hardly find any publication from India. I will repeatedly come back to everybody kindly publish. We have a wise, very vast experience. So that is something which we have to do that conduct good research and publish it. But then with multiple personal, multiple countries involved in research, it was actually becoming difficult to see what is right, what is wrong. There were diverse results from all the research. 
And Archie Cochrane was the first scientist who way back in 1971 published. <laughs> Hello? On healthcare effectiveness and efficiency. In fact, what he stated is practice of medicine is an art based on science. The science of uncertainty and the art of probability. But we owe a lot to him when he said that we do need to do research synthesis and subsequently the diverse results of research publications, scientific community led by Iron Chambers got together and a foundation was laid for Cochrane collaboration in 1993, which has a motto of trusted evidence, informed decisions and better health. So Archie Cochrane was no longer alive, but this was named after Cochrane because he was the one who gave a concept that we have to have evidence. Cochrane has 53 review groups which conduct research on data related to health, not research, but research on whatever is published. In fact, I am a member in three of these groups and we go through each paper published and decide if the current guidelines or reviews need to be updated in view of this recent publication. In fact, Cochrane Collaboration is continuously engaged in updating whatever references, collecting all the human studies, whatever being published, and then they undergo a vigorous process of systematic review, about which you are going to learn soon in the CME. But yes, it is very, very important that you can conduct a good review only if you have good quality publications. Guidelines are prepared following strict guidelines, not that two or three experts say there are strict guidelines, all the evidence is graded by a grade system, and accordingly, all the biases are taken care of. In fact, now there is a new robot which is a bias assessment tool, which tries to remove different kinds of biases from the research publication. Besides biases, one thing which one worries in the current scenario is misinformation, which is actually, we all read so much about COVID misinformation, especially being encouraged by social media, and other things and all. Uh, I would end by also making one more statement. There was a very interesting publication just in the last issue of New England Journal of Medicine where they were talking about open access publication has been now for almost more than a decade. But then he made a statement that anybody can pay $15,000 and publish any article, can get it peer reviews, not important, nothing is important. So we have to take care of all this kind of misinformation and also assess each publication whether it is really, really genuine. Then only you can generate evidence-based guidelines. With this, I wish a good luck to all of you and a very healthy discussion with expert panelists and speakers here. And I'm sure you will, at the end of this CME, everyone is going to be more oriented towards how to do systematic reviews and how to prepare guidelines. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I think we all have a very uh, optimistic view of this uh, program, and we really do wish that we're able to take this forward and we are able to work together. So uh, now we start with the program. I am very happy to introduce our uh, Master of Ceremonies and that is Dr. Divya. Can I have a, a, a slide please? So Dr. Divya is an Associate Professor at uh, VMMC and Sabdajang Hospital. She is a Joint Secretary of AOGD, Narchi Branch, member AOGD, Safe Mother Committee. She's, she's a young faculty, very enthusiastic. And as you can see here, she's got a list of awards to her credit. 
So uh, welcome to you, Divya. I hand over the floor to you, please. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'll start with the uh, session one. I would like to invite the chairpersons for the session. Himanshu, yeah. So uh, I take the privilege to invite Dr. Asmita Rathor as our first uh, uh, chairperson for the session one. Madam is director, professor, and HOD at Molana Azad Medical College, New Delhi. She has authored many uh, publications and had been editor of four books. She had been an investigator of many national and international research uh, projects. She had been expert member of Task Force Maternal Health, National Health Authority. Uh, and she is the current president uh, of uh, NARCHI and uh, the next AOGD president. I welcome you, ma'am. Next, I welcome uh, Dr. Manchu. Next slide, please. Dr. Ashok Kumar, sir. Sir is Director, Professor, and Head of uh, Department of Ops and Gaini at uh, Dr. Ramanova Loya Hospital, New Delhi. And he's the current Secretary of Indian College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. I welcome you, sir. Next, I invite Dr. Lena Sridhar. Madam is Senior Consultant, Obstetrics and Gynecology Department at Manipal Hospital, Dwarka, New Delhi, and is HOD Academics and Research uh, of the hospital. And uh, she has been recipient of many awards, uh, APJ Abdul Kalam Award for Excellence and APJ Abdul Kalam Award in Critical Care, to name a few. I welcome you, ma'am. I hand over the session to the chairpersons for the further proceedings. Uh, thank you, Dr. Divya. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for the invite to be part of such an interesting CME. The first session in our CME is a talk on topic, what is evidence-based practice, levels of evidence and research methods. To speak on the topic, we have Dr. Mina Savant. She is the senior consultant and head of the department of Kurji Holy Family Hospital at Patna, Bihar. She's chairperson of Foxy Clinical Research Committee. Secretary General of ISOPA and held various positions in Patna OBGYN Society. She is a, a DNB teacher and has published many papers in reputed journals. So, without wasting much time, we would like to listen to her. Over to you, Dr. Mina. And thank you, Dr. Rathor, for the kind introduction. Uh, at the outset, thanks to the uh, organizers, Dr. Radhika, Dr. Achla Batra. Uh, for inviting me, for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this wonderful initiative that you all have taken. Congratulations for that. Well, I know it's a prelude to the guidelines development that you all have planned. Can you see my slides, please? Can you see my slides? No, no we can't. Please okay. share your screen, Dr. Mina. Okay, okay. Just a second. Is it now visible? Yeah, now we can see. Yes. Can you make it screen yes. show, please? Yes, yes. So, uh, and this is only the highlights because uh, everything we're going to hear about that, but then we also have to have a little basic, uh, you know, a background to the evidence-based practice, the level of evidence and research studies. This is the topic that has been given to me. Uh, so uh, let me start by saying that evidence-based practice is the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in helping individual patients make decisions about their care in light of their personal values and beliefs. So I, th I would say that each of these words that I've marked is very important. So consciences would be being careful and thorough in what we do. Explicit is being upfront, open, clear and transparent and judicious using the good judgment and common sense. And we need to find the modern, the up-to-date current evidence. And we have to respect the patient's beliefs and preferences. So this is what David Sackett said about evidence-based medicine, the integration of the best research. So that's what we're talking about, the clinical expertise and not forgetting the patient's values. I think it all started with the Flexner report in 1910, where 
He established an educational quality standard and found that many of the existing schools in US would not meet the standards and many of them even closed down. And this report is widely regarded as the start of the EBM movement. Then as our chief guest, Madam Mittal has mentioned about Archie Cochrane, uh, the Scottish epidemiologist, and of course he kind of, you know, brought the revolution and his work has been honored honor through naming the centers of evidence-based medical research as the Cochrane Centers, an international organization, the Cochrane Collaboration. And much later, the explicit methodologies used to define best evidence were largely established by McMaster University Research Group, led by David Sackett and the Gordon Ga Garrett in 1995, they endeavored to close the research to practice gap by encouraging the doctors to go on for learning about new research findings that they could incorporate in their practice. Then again, it is an approach that aims to improve the process through which high quality scientific research evidence can be obtained and translated into the best practical decisions to improve health. Actually, that is what we are looking at. Uh, so as this, uh, you know, this diagram is telling us how clinical expertise, clinic, uh, client perspective, that is the patient perspectives and the evidence, both internal and external, they go on to form the, uh, the evidence-based practice. So let me just, you know, touch upon each of these factors, resources and expertise. So the expert health professionals, that is the clinicians, uh, they form a major chunk of this whole, uh, you know, the triad. The resources needed to deliver treatment would also include the physical, the technological, financial, and the personal assets, like the office space, technological support, insurance reimbursement, et cetera. Additional resources may include institutional endorsement by higher administration and agreement from other system components to make a treatment uh, available. Then what about the patient? Uh, I mean, this was kind of a neglected and we would have that patriarchal, this thing that uh, what doctors said the best, but not anymore. Now attributes such as not just the patients, you know, the values and preferences, but there are other things to consider. Attributes such as state and the trait variations in the condition, the needs, the history of treatment response. They all influence whether a treatment is well matched to a particular patient. So health professionals also need to assess the comparability between the patient and the study population, that is the external validity of the study that we think is applicable to that particular, uh, you know, the need of the patient um, uh, disease. Tailoring surface aspects of the treatment can enhance, enhance its acceptability to the patient, but we should not stray from the core, you know, the um, uh, intent, the fidelity of treatment elements that uh, it should not lose its effectiveness so as to just, you know, going with the patient's demands. The interprofessional evidence-based practice model is grounded in an ecological framework that emphasizes the importance of considering environmental and organizational spheres when conceptualizing the problems. So uh, we have the best research evidence. We know our patient's characteristics and needs and values. And the resources, that means including the patient practitioner's expertise, and this all goes on to make a decision uh, making. But at the same time, uh, where are we working? Are we in AIMS? Are we in a you know, tertiary level center? Are we in a periphery? Are we in a rural center? You know, all those things also go on to tell us how to, what we're gonna do for the patient. Uh, that is also the importance, I guess, because we're talking about uh, guideline information. So keeping in mind our, you know, our uh, state where we are working uh, for our Indian uh, patients, our Indian uh, background. So that's how our Indian guidelines are going to help us there. Health professionals have a central role. They are the primary researchers who directly contribute to the forming of the evidence base. We are you know, the, um, the researchers who are doing the primary researches, the trials and all. 
Then we have the secondary researchers, the systematic reviewers. Uh, Dr. Radhika is going to talk more in detail. And, you know, it comes to us in a platter, but we know there's a lot of work that goes, you know, behind you synthesizing the evidence. Systematic reviewers then dis disseminate their findings to health professionals in the form of succinct summaries that offer evidence-based practice recommendations for the practicing clinicians. And then again, as the clinicians as such, they interact directly with the patient's characteristics, the resources, considerations, and also they also have to assess that the research evidence that is available and assess its quality and relevance to the patient and the context at hand. So this is actually the same diagram, which is also now incorporating how the doctors, the clinicians are involved at each level. And what is generally considered the five steps of EBP, that is evidence-based practice, the five A's. First is to ask patient-oriented questions, well-formulated questions about the health status and context of uh, individuals, communities or populations. Step two would be acquire the best available evidence to answer the questions. Step three, to appraise the evidence critically for validity and applicability to the problem at hand and apply the evidence by engaging in collaborative health decision making with the affected individuals or groups. We don't stop there. We also have to go on to analyze the health practice and adjust the practice accordingly, evaluate the implications of future decision making, disseminate the results and identify a new information need. So it's an ongoing process. So these are the five steps that I just mentioned. And also the five ways this evidence-based practice adds to the value to health systems would be helps clinicians stay current on standardized evidence-based protocols, uses near real-time data to make care decisions, improves transparency, accountability, and value, improves the quality of care, and improves the outcome. Isn't that what we all are aiming at? So now the evidence for the cl practicing clinicians, you know, the time is limited. They are, you know, busy with their patients. So how do they make the efficiently use this evidence in their practice? So now acquiring the best evidence, central to the evidence-based medicine is the use of best possible evidence in diagnostic and treatment decisions where best is defined by a hierarchy of quality of study designs providing evidence. Most reliable evidence is generated by the systematic reviews of RCTs, which minimize bias and allow for causal interpretation of new interventions. Now, if we just look at the level of evidence, at the top, 1A is systematic review of randomized controlled trials, 1B, would be individual randomized trials, uh, which would be good quality uh, with a narrow confidence interval. 2A, the systematic review of cohort studies of exposed and the unexposed uh, uh, subjects. 2B would be individual cohort study, low quality RCTs. 3A, systematic review of homogeneous case control studies. Then below that comes the individual case studies. Four would be case series, low quality cohort and the case uh, studies and right at the bottom we have expert opinions based on systematic reviews and results and other studies. So this is how the hierarchy of evidence uh, pyramid goes. Uh, below, uh, at the bottom we have the case series, case reports, the cross-sectional case control cohort and the RCTs. These are the basic re uh, researches but then the secondary researches churned out of all these basic researches would be the systematic reviews, meta-analysis, and the guidelines. So these are mostly the quantitative research that we uh, talk concentrate on, and I have, um, uh, just the experimental used to test causal relationships, involves manipulating an independent variable and measuring its effect on dependent one, Subjects are randomly assigned to the two groups, usually conducted in a controlled environment. While in quasi-experimental, 
They again are used to test causal relationships. They are similar to the experimental, but the random assignment is not there. And uh, so it involves outcomes of pre-existing groups and conducted, conducted in a natural environment. We also have correlational studies, descriptive studies. So just briefly, you know, I'll touch upon those because, uh, because uh, from this is the base of what gives us the um, meta-analysis and the reviews. A case report has its own uh, importance. It gives a detailed report of any diagnosis, something interesting, something anecdotal, new treatment, response to treatment and follow-up. And series would be a number of series. We know so many important things have come from case series. They, you know, help in generating hypothesis. Then uh, we have the cross-sectional uh, studies, also called the prevalence study. Uh, it examines subjects at a single point of time. And by definition, it is observational. Uh, so an example would be the survey of population to determine the prevalence of, say, lung cancer or any other disease, distribution of the health problem by time, place, and person. So we know that in 2021, it was the COVID. In 22, it, 21, it was so on. Like we have some kind of thing which, is, which makes a priority where our health resources would be concentrated on. Set priorities for disease control, generate hypothesis, and examine the evolving trend. So correlation studies. No, it investigates the relationships between variables with researchers controlling where researchers, any of them, they will not be controlling any of them. The direction of correlation can either be positive or it could be a negative or zero correlation. And because it is conducted in the natural you know, environment, we can say it has a high external uh, validity because that's how we get the population. Surveys, uh, it again is done in three ways. The surveys, which is quick, flexible way to collect standardized data from many participants. It involves a random sampling of the variables or subjects in research in which participants fill a questionnaire centered on a subject of interest. It could be also naturalistic where observation is a correlation research methodology that involves observing people's behavior as shown in natural environment where there exist over a period of time. Then it could also be a secondary data or an archival data where you can use the data that has already been collected for a different purpose, uh, such as office records, polls, or previous studies. And then we can you know, collect the data and see how after it is statistically analyzed using correlation or the regression analysis, or maybe both. So this is uh, this in this example we have the maternal deaths and the contraceptive prevalence. As the prevalence increases, the maternal death rate has decreased. So it's just a correlation that it is showing. Uh, then uh, we have the case control studies. So it means we have a disease and we are looking for the cause. What caused it? A case control. Uh, is it's a, again an observational but an analytical kind of a study, a retrospective one which looks backwards in time to assess the information. A case control study compares people who have a specific condition and outcome being studied, known as cases, with people who do not have the condition or outcome, known as controls. So they look back and see, let's say, for example, a case control study that assesses the lifetime smoking exposure of patients with and without lung cancer. Then coming to the, uh, 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 let's step on ahead in the hierarchy, that is the cohort study. Cohort studies start with a group of exposed and a group of unexposed individuals. They are followed up over time and assessed to see who develops the disease. A cohort is a type of longitudinal observational study. An example is a study, uh, an example is in a study that observes whether subjects smoke and then how many years as we follow them, do they develop the cancer uh, as compared to non-smokers or the, you know, all people working in uh, x-ray department, how many of them go on to have those, uh, some, you know, uh, radiation problems or maybe the aniline dye case, like so on. So then uh, the quasi-experimental study. 
It is a design that again aims to establish a cause and effect relationship between an independent and a dependent variable. However, subjects are assigned to groups based on non-random criteria as against the RCTs. Now this happens uh, because uh, there are some ethical concerns. Sometimes it would be unethical to provide or withhold a treatment on a random basis. So a true experiment is not feasible. Uh, then they, it could be the, you know, some practical issues may be there. True experimental design may be infeasible to implement or simply too expensive, particularly for researchers without access to large funding streams. So uh, they make use of what is there. But again, those who are getting the treatment and those who are not getting without any random allocation. But again, it has the advantage that is a, it has higher external validity than most true experiments because they often involve real world interventions instead of artificial uh, you know, uh, forced settings. Uh, however, there are lower internal uh, validity than true experiments without randomization because we've not taken care of the confounding factors. Then uh, we have the randomized controlled trials. And as uh, Cochrane said, this is at the highest level of the pyramid of evidence. Uh, it is a prospective study that measures the efficacy of an intervention or treatments that subjects are randomly assigned to either an experimental or control group. The control groups receive a placebo or sham intervention while experimental group receives the intervention being studied. Randomizing the subjects is effective in at removing bias, thus increasing the validity. Uh, and also many times it is a blinded one. Then we have the systematic reviews and meta-analysis. We'll be hearing a lot on this. Uh, it, it synthesizes the results from all available studies of a particular health topic answering a specific research question by collecting and evaluating all research evidence that fits the reviews selection criteria. The most well-known collection of systematic, that is the Cochrane database, then uh, the systematic reviews can include meta-analysis in which statistical methods are applied to evaluate and synthesize quantitative results from multiple studies. So we've uh, so these are actually the type of studies that answer a particular kind of questions. We've talked of the quantitative, but there we also have the qualitative research to understand why and how in a population, because uh, the social uh, values, the demography, they all can, you know, uh, affect the health issues. So it could be a case report, ethnography. So I'll not go into the detail, but then the qualitative research is becoming more and more uh, important. So finally, coming to the conclusion of this brief introduction is that we have to look for the best current evidence through primary and secondary research. Practitioners need to be apprised of the evidence that is applicable to their patient circumstances, respecting their preferences. And health professionals have central role as primary researchers, systematic reviewers, and disseminating their findings to the clinicians. And as clinicians, uh, we have to interact directly with the patient's characteristics and the available re resources uh, to give the best to the patients. So thank you all for the patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Meena, for such a comprehensive presentation. Your presentation has nicely covered various study designs and emphasize that evidence-based practice not only depend on the research evidence of various quality, but also from the expertise available, the research resources available and the patient values. Thank you so much for such a nice presentation. Uh, over to Dr. Lena for any question and answers. Yes, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Meena. Um, I have a very simple question. I mean, it was a wonderful talk and uh, and I particularly like that pyramid of evidence, you know, uh, which shows, uh, you know, the, the the progressive way, you know, we are coming down and, and I can understand that, you know, case series must be the, uh, you know, the most basic evidence that can uh, be put forward by a clinician. So I just wanted to ask you, what do you think from your, uh, you know, from from all these, you know, the, the various, uh, um, 
I think eight uh, kinds of uh, the pyramid of evidence that you put forward. What do you think would be the best for a country like India with its vast kind of you know uh, clinicians, whether they are in the private sector, they are in the public uh, hospitals. What do you think would be one the best uh, uh, method of gaining evidence, or or you could say for that matter, doing research? I think we uh, uh, because uh, we all have our own limited resor uh, resources at different levels. Um, just a second, Vijay. Uh, so, you know, uh, we all can contribute in our own different ways. Even case reports are important. So if we get those, we cannot just, you know, or put them off. But yes, mm -hmm. um, I think uh, we have people from Ames and Maulana Azad and um, uh, the mm -hmm. University, the Delhi University. So they, at those levels, mm -hmm. doing a meta-analysis, RCT is something. But most of the other times we can go in for, you know, quasi experimental, uh, that would be more feasible in other uh, centers where those tight, this thing may not be available. So I think we cannot put down, but collecting all and then finally at our doing an analysis of, of our own studies based in India, I think that is the best result that we can give to our clinicians and uh, for our patients. I think, and that is the idea for today's workshop or uh, the introductory lecture, I guess. Yes, um, I mean, when you talk about an institution and in, in an institution putting forth his, uh, their, uh, you know, perspective of the evidence that they have from the studies that they have done, it's fine. But when we talk about at a, a national level, uh, you know, there are so many uh, variants in, uh, you know, is even from state to state and from uh, setup, uh, a small setup, a big setup, but everybody is, uh, you know, uh, uh, doing, for example, I'll just give you an example, uh, because, uh, you know, when we talk like we are a guy, we are all gynecologists. Now, uh, recently, there was a, a talk about, you know, utilizing a particular drug for the prevention of postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, so we had a detailed discussion and we found that, you know, that, uh, um, you know, a good, um, that drug is not available to a huge uh, number of clinicians while it is available to a certain number of clinicians. So, uh, you know, so to be absolutely certain that, you know, that particular drug is going to be the, uh, you know, the game changer for PPH is very difficult. Because I may talk about my experience and somebody else would talk about, you know, having an institution which is, has maybe a huge number of uh, patients, they have used it, but they have not been able to access that particular drug. So that's where we uh, sort of, uh, we end up not getting the true picture as a clinician. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely right. And that is why uh, what environment we are working in, what resources we have, they become so important. Yes, sir. Uh, I uh, think good, that's good where we have to. Uh, sorry, Ashok. Uh, uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Meena Samant. You have very uh, vastly covered the topic and elaborated the various type of studies and evidence-based evidences. Uh, see, I have a different take on this uh, on the research, Dr. Radhika. Uh, I think I have discussed with you also. And uh, Dr. Meena, you are also the chairman of research committee of uh, uh, Foxy. Yeah. You know, we can have all these uh, uh, evidence-based medicine and all the type of studies and everything, what are the methodology, how to do the guidelines, but where is the initiative? The issue is of initiative. See, we have a lot of material available around us, especially for Indian uh, scenario. And we all from the medical colleges, lot of material. I have learned un under Dr. Sunita Mittal, Lot of clinical material, lot of uh, material to record. Only thing is you have to record the material. Record the things and that can be converted into research. But uh, uh, I'm afraid uh, medical colleges all over India are only doing research on the name of thesis of the postgraduate. And most of the time they are not for publication also. So where is the research going on? Where is the initiative? The other part is, uh, research funding. Oh. At the moment, if you see earlier, I think five years before, some agencies were granting research funding. 
but uh, now th those have also stopped uh, granting a research fund and institutional funding is not available there is no priority to the research see we all are working in a medical college our priority is patient care there is no incentive or no interest shown by the administration or by the uh, college or by the university. so where is the initiative where is the, how the research will come the main main problem is this we can have lot many cme lot many uh, pick up or lot many uh, workshops or whatever we can do but uh, where is the initiative and where is the uh, interest of research that is the main problem now we are facing and especially in obg why we are we have other part also to see so that is the main thing at least in other specialty we are getting Uh, more uh, evidences in this thing. So, so can I so, take that, uh, Doctor Ashok? So, so yes. I think we need to get together since we all appreciate that there is a lack of initiative and a talk. So, I think this is a small beginning. Let us take this forward and uh, develop groups of people who you know are solely uh, they they can uh, allocate time in the direction of not only primary research because we might have lot of research already available there in the field. We need to collate those. and also you know be uh, uh, empowered to undertake other types of researches so that was uh, no, that, 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 that's that's fine doctor that is rather a fine mm -hmm. but i am requesting dr meena saman from the clinical research of foxy that at least foxy should work on uh, opening up these uh, or facilitate <coughs> these type of something yeah that i think meena has been trying uh, since the no, past actually, years actually uh, you know one uh, this thing is the ethical committee and all that we talk to foxy they are not willing because there are so many i mean uh there are very strict uh, regulations regarding that so they're not open to that yes surveys yes they can do and if you've done some good this thing we can we can pre uh, give our uh, you know the idea to the foxy if they like they may help you in publishing it uh, that is they have that's what i could gather from there and so i want think the research and you want some grant you can request them write to them they may be able to help you with that that they can uh, do but so, as such the ethical the foxy itself would not take uh, the this thing so Because, can i interrupt this discussion please uh, very yeah. sorry to interrupt so uh, i think uh, we can at the end of the program have a deep discussion on this Uh, matter because this is a vexing problem we've been facing this in so many years i think that's a very well valid point uh, taken uh, dr ashok uh, but then i think uh, we need to also uh, be able to take the program forward and i think we can discuss this probably with time permitting yeah, at the exactly. end it is okay that's what, you know we have to take small steps and maybe we will be able to uh, you know take bigger steps later but let us at least begin by you know orienting people to research and then we'll take the bigger step and if there is a will there is a way you know those who want to work they will find some way dr shok when you went to mamsi from aims you were the first one to get a project from icmr there nobody did research proper project there followed so i know it's difficult but if there is a will there be there is a way and yes. there are funding agency there are other resources there are ethical committees you know no, willing no, to no, help devi sharma dr ashok was only trying to make a point to foxy i yeah. think no no very well point point is very well taken but definitely yeah, yeah <laughs> so i think devi uh, uh, after such an interesting discussion let us move to the next session i thank you all the chairpersons and dr meena saman for uh, that informative talk So for the next session, I uh, would like to invite the chairpersons. Our first chairperson is Dr. Ramita Suneja. Madam is a director professor in HOD uh, Obs and Gynae Department at UCMS and GTB Hospital Delhi, and uh, she had been recipient of uh, Best Doctor Award and Teacher of Teachers Award. Uh, she had many publications and edited uh, three books. So I welcome you, ma'am. Uh, our next. chairperson is uh, our own uh, dr achla batra ma'am uh, ma'am uh, 
as I've already introduced her in the beginning, Madam is uh, uh, President AOGD. She has conducted research projects uh, for LSTM and ICMR and uh, Indo-US projects. And she has authored many chapters, publications, and uh, uh, many research papers in national and international journals. And she had been contributor to many Ministry of Health and Family Welfare guidelines. Uh, welcome, Dr. Achla. Our third Chairperson is Dr. J.B. Sharma, sir. Sir is currently uh, working as professor at Ames, New Delhi, and uh, he had many publications, and uh, uh, two of his books are very famous amongst the postgraduate, the textbook of the obstetrics and textbook of gynecology. Sir has been awarded uh, Dr. B.C. Roy Award, and he won the ICMR Amrit Modi Unicam Prize for his research work in anemia during pregnancy. So I welcome you, sir. So uh, I now request uh, Dr. Amita Suneja, ma'am, to introduce our next speaker. Um, thank you, Divya, and uh, very good evening. So it's my pleasing duty to formally introduce Dr. A.G. Radhika, who is a senior consultant uh, in University College of Medical Sciences in GTT. She's dear friend and dear colleague, and... Um, um, she has been the great pillar of the gynae department and most well-read person. And uh, Radhika will always, you know, think out of box. And her keen interest is in um, evidence-based uh, science and development of guidelines. And today, CME is her brainchild. So her all the achievements are centered around this theme. She has been active member of AOGD and Foxy and uh, pursuing this. Um, evidence-based medicine. And she's even representing at international level by being the member of Geneva Foundation for Medical Education and Research. The, her latest achievement I would like to mention is that she has, um, recently her book, uh, she has edited Asian edition of Novik gynecology textbook um, in the market. So platform is now yours, Radhika, please. She will talk on the steps for to get the systematic reviews. And as you already heard, systematic review is, you know, it's a synthesis of evidence from already with research which has been done in a systematic manner. So we all have around 100 publications, but I'm sure very few authors have written the systematic reviews. So every one of us is going to be uh, enriched today. So Radhika, please. Thank you so um, much, ma'am for the uh, kind introduction and very, very encouraging words. So, uh, my talk today is on the uh, conduct of systematic review. So, uh, what we uh, just now heard uh, from Dr. Meena Samant was of the primary research, and I'm going to focus on the secondary research because uh, that is something today, the need of time. The, Dr. Ashok's uh, concerns were very well placed. I completely, uh, you know, uh, synchronized with him. The only point is that the wherewithals for primary research, the time and funding may not be available. So since we already have a lot of material out there, it is also a good idea to consider the, these secondary forms of research, primarily being well-conducted systematic review. So as you can find here, this is the hierarchy of evidence that Dr. Meena had spoken about. And uh, you know the why are the systematic reviews placed at the topmost part of the pyramid? It is because as the, uh, the, the system of research improves, the number of biases go on going down. So uh, expert opinion, case series, case control uh, studies, they have a high degree of bias. And as we go towards well-conducted RCTs and systematic reviews, then the bias goes down. So what is bias? Bias is the difference between the study results and the truth. And when we talk of evidence, we want to get the, uh, the truth. We want to get to the bottom of the uh, real scenario and what is actually the truth so that we are able to translate that into practice. So uh, it is well said when we talk about that uh, sitting, you know, writing in a file or writing a book, when it comes to the real case scenario of research, it becomes difficult. So conducting systematic reviews in RCTs is a challenge, but once one is, you know, empowered to do that, uh, trained to do that, it is a great idea to undertake the same. 
So, uh, like I said, the bias in research is the most vexing problem, and this is what which takes us away from the real case of uh, finding the real truth. So, there are uh, basically six types of biases. There could be, you know, met methodological errors, meaning the selection bias, the performance bias, detection bias. There could be reporting bias, the publication bias. This is something extremely important. We would have all noted uh, the positive results are easily published. Negative results might be difficult to, uh, uh, you know, get through to. And then there is, of course, uh, during the met methodological part there could be attrition bias. So, uh, you know, when we talk about the RCTs, these are generally taken care of well. And, uh, you know, to a large extent, these biases are reduced. And that is why these uh, the RCTs are considered one of the best forms of evidence. So once, uh, you know, you conduct a good systematic review or you conduct a good RCT, these form the basic uh, format for undertaking the formulation of a good clinical practice guideline. And that is why is the reason for today's CME. We start with the primary research, go on to the secondary, and then finally understand how to develop a clinical practice guideline. So what is a systematic review? It is a systematically locating, critically appraising, and synthesizing the evidence from scientific studies to obtain a reliable, unbiased overview. So that is very important. And therefore, it aims to be systematic in its identification of literature, explicit in its statement of objectives and methodology, it has to be reproducible and it has to be transparent. It is extremely important. These two words are very important. It's not as if I undertake a systematic review and it finishes. If somebody elsewhere in the world reproduces, because I would have given every step in a very logical, transparent manner, it has to be reproducible to validate my findings. The results of multiple primary studies related to each other are synthesized by using strategies that reduce biases and random errors. And it may not always be associated uh, with the statistical synthesis or the meta-analysis. And it depends on whether the studies are similar enough to enable calculation of meaningful results. Meaning it could be narrative or along with it could be having a meta-analysis. So uh, we are all, I, I'm sure, very familiar with the literature review and the narrative reviews that the, the traditional reviews that are published. You know, They are also the expert opinions. But there is a basic difference between the systematic review and it is systematic review and not systemic review as many people mistakenly call it. A systematic review is very focused. It is based on the PICO uh, format of uh, research question formulation. The protocol is peer reviewed. It summarizes succinctly the available literature. The objectives are very specific and uh, you know, uh, pertinent to the point. The criteria stated before the review are uh, very clear with regard to the inclusion and exclusion of the studies. It is comprehensive and systematic with respect to the search of literature. It is very clear and explicit in selection of articles. And this is followed by the critical appraisal and evaluation of the studies, extraction of the data, and finally the synthesis of results. So the protocol gets published for others to see, whereas nothing of the sort actually happens in the traditional level. So this is something that the author identifies as clinically important through experience, summarizes whatever available literature the person could uh, you know, reach up to, and the objectives may not be identified, the criteria may not be clear, and so on and so forth. So that is why today's systematic reviews are taken as uh, good, well-conducted systematic reviews are, conducted, are considered important for evidence. So what is the importance? They could be important for the clinical policy and guideline formulation. They support evidence-based practice. Identify the gaps of research. So once you undertake, you collate so many primary research together. At the end of it, once you have filtered the evidence, you also identify what is not available. In fact, many of the funding agencies ask you to undertake a systematic review to justify why you want to undertake a certain research. Your, uh, actually, your protocol and your uh, papers have to be very, uh, you know, uh, uh, they, they really have to justify the reason why you under, uh, want to undertake a research for the funding agencies to be able to support you. And another big benefit is where the number of sample size is limited, uh, you know, collating so many studies together, bring the numbers, the requisite numbers together. And especially so if there are many studies which are conflicting in their results. So the systematic review helps you to find a uh, a path, whether it is positive or negative, and it provides evidence that more research, uh, you know, where, where you end the primary research, what is the time when no, no further primary research is uh, required. 
Now, this is a standing example of what happened in the, in the, in the field of obsengyne. You know, uh, we all know today that uh, the st antenatal steroids are extremely important life-saving for the premature births. Now, if you look at the number of RCTs that were conducted, it started way back in 1972. This was the very first RCT, good RCT, which was conducted. And, uh, you know, there are so many uh, further RCTs were done after that. And about uh, six or seven RCTs were good enough to, uh, by, by 1988, it was very clear that the uh, steroids are very useful in the prevention of pre uh, the premature mortality. However, people kept on doing so many studies. And as uh, you know, the, the Cochrane later got activated, they were the ones in 1991 who, uh, through meta-analysis, showed that the steroids reduced the uh, death rate by about 30 to 50 percent. At that time, the, the, the uh, uh, Cochrane collaboration as well as meta-analysis wasn't so popular. So, and that is the reason why so many studies were undertaken, so much time and money was wasted. And so many children, more importantly, did not receive the drug and this resulted in mortality, uh, you know, which is tuned to about 10,000 plus. And that is the reason today that WHO has included in the list of essential medicines, dexamethasone for prevention of premature birth. So uh, that is the place for systematic review. So how does one undertake a systematic review? We need a team of at least three to five people. Why? Because we need at least two subject experts, one who is well-versed with the methodology, uh, a statistician would be a good idea to have, and also a librarian who is well-versed in the literature search. At least three people would be a good idea because uh, there is a screening of the, the, the literature to be done. If there is any uh, difference in opinion between the two, there has to be a third person who will be able to resolve the difference. One has to be ready for the time commitment, have a plan uh, and a set timeline and maintain good records. Record keeping is extremely important. And also it is a good idea to consider for funding. Now, what are the basic steps? It is important to identify the question, which is uh, you know, based on the experience, the clinical importance, and what is of urgency? What needs to be, like for instance, somebody was talking about anemia. So the, our country, despite 60 years of anemia control program, has not been able to make a, a dent in the, uh, in the complete burden of anemia. So uh, relevance and contextual is extremely important. You do a scoping search on, a search on what is already available. From there, devise a protocol and then conduct a comprehensive research, search for the available literature. Identify the studies uh, based on the eligibility criteria. Appraise those studies based on the quality checklist. Extract the data, analyze the results, interpret the findings. And finally, dissemination of the reports, meaning publication and dissemination through meetings is extremely important because it is a very hard work done in the direction of creating evidence. At this point, I would like to bring to everybody's notice the PRISMA checklist. This is the preferred, preferred re reporting items for systematic review and meta-analysis. And it, it can be uh, downloaded through this link. And it is very essential. It would be a good idea to read this before starting a systematic review because it tells you how to develop a systematic review protocol and what to include when writing up the review. So this is a Prisma checklist, which was uh, you know, released in 2020. It, has been, it is getting constantly uh, revised every year or every two or three years. It's got uh, you know, items of uh, 27 numbers and it literally hand holds to you know, take you through the planning of a systematic review. Objective study inclusion and exclusion have to be clearly and precisely defined. And again, we are, I'm sure, very familiar with the PICO statement, the participants, intervention, comparators, uh, and the outcomes in the studies. And based on this, the objective is set, for example, to assess the effect of an intervention or a comparison for a health problem uh, in the group of people or the disease or the problem in the setting. So uh, it has to be specific and, and that is why it has to be contextual, which can be translated. Because now, uh, you know, when uh, I was also involved with FOXI, whenever you talk about guidelines, they're more comfortable with good clinical practice recommendations because they say if you formulate a guideline, it has to be necessarily acquired by all. And you know, one is not very confident if others will feel so. So uh, it, uh, it, is, it is important to have good quality guidelines which are you know, resourced through these good quality, either primary studies or through systematic reviews. Cochrane recommends four kinds of basic study designs which have to be included in systematic reviews. These could be RCTs, clinical control trials, controlled before and after studies, and interrupted time series studies. 
Now I'm not going into the details of the disease. Uh, it could also be uh, today we can also do uh, the systematic reviews of observational studies. It could be clinical diagnostics. It could be prevalence. Uh, you know, we could go into the depth and details of all this at a later time. But it is important to remember not to mix apples and oranges. This is traditionally spoken about whenever systematic review is talked about, we talk about apples and oranges because the two fruits are so different. If you combine a poor quality study with a good quality study, uh, statistical analysis differently done with another study, which is called a different analysis, or the methodological quality could be different between the two, observational versus an RCT, the quality of a systematic review suffers. It is important to identify the study that you wish to include in your uh, uh, in your systematic review, which is already mentioned in the protocol. It is a great idea to register your protocol in any of these sites, the Cochrane Collaboration, Jonah Briggs Institute, and Prospero. So this lets the world see what you're working on. And when you publish the report, so uh, you know registering your protocol and publishing the protocol is it's in itself a publication. And having a systematic review in place is certainly having your name registered in the history of, uh, you know, OBS and Gynae. So literature search in systematic review is a different ball game. It, you know, you need to cast a large net to collect as many studies as possible. And from there you define. So uh, at least two or three authors are involved. So uh, the, the system, the, the, uh, all the studies are gathered together. And then uh, you do a title and abstract screening. From there, you identify the studies which could possibly fit in to your systematic review. And after this, uh, the, the data extraction is done. After doing the analysis and the, the critical appraisal of the studies, the data extraction is done. So uh, there is a very important need to define the sources to be searched, the search process, and selecting the studies for inclusion, because uh, this is what is something which is very transparent for the other person to replicate. They, people have to be sure that you have seen whatever data is available, whatever studies are available in the field. So language should not be a barrier. People prefer uh, one to not only restrict to, uh, to not get restricted to English only. It could be Spanish, German, and other languages. Sometimes you require a translator to even you know, help you out in this direction. Important to develop a process to document each of these steps and inclusion of the librarian is useful. So, like I said, these are the important steps which are, uh, you know, there during the uh, formulation of a systematic review. And today we have free softwares. Covidence is one which I have personally used, very, very user friendly. The first review is free and then it is subscription based. It takes you literally hand holds through all these steps, you know, and the advantage is that uh, many authors can uh, work together online. So it collates the uh, responses of each of these and it helps to keep the coordination on. Uh, a word about the study quality, all included studies should be assessed for quality and the risk of bias. Uh, standard critical appraisal tools are available for the various types of studies. Two reviewers minimum have to complete this step and uh, any difference has to be resolved by a third reviewer. The extract the study quality data record the agreement between the two reviewers, remove the low quality studies and those with high risk of bias from the review. So these are the critical appraisal tools. These could be downloaded from the CASP site and also from the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, which is hosted by the McMaster University. So then you have the data extraction. The two reviewers extract the data. Why again two reviewers? Because data may not be always found in consistent places. It can be very easy to misinterpret or miss the information. And before the data extraction, it is important to also decide the detail to which you want to get into. You may not want to extract all the data. So again, that has to be also clearly uh, reported in the protocol. This is followed by the data synthesis. So like I said, it could be narrative or it could be uh, quantitative. So meaning a meta-analysis, or it could be simply a structured summary with discussion of the studies, including their characteristics and the findings. So quickly going on to uh, meta-analysis, it is a, a process of quantitative, it is a, you know, systematically uh, combining the results of research, which is a quantitative approach to arrive at the conclusions. So uh, what is the difference between the meta-analysis of a systematic review versus the analysis that one undertakes in a primary research? So in a study, the individual subjects are the uh, 
data points. So if you have 100 subjects, you have 100 data points. Whereas in a meta-analysis, it is individual studies which constitute, which constitute the data points. So it is 100 studies which form the 100 data points. So that makes all the difference. So could we just add together all the data points from all the uh, trials together? So that is not a good idea as, this, as can be very uh, clearly seen from this antenatal steroid example. If you were to just add uh, the total number of the tests and the control, uh, the total number of uh, people with the events and the total sample size, and uh, you find the, the relative risk, it comes against uh, uh, the favor of steroids, the mortality is higher. Whereas when you do a meta-analysis and a statistical analysis, uh, as is done for a systematic review, one can find that if there is a beneficial effect in the direction of steroids. How does this happen? Because the meta-analysis meta is done two-stage process. One calculates an effect estimate, that is a summary statistics, that is the RR, OR, or HR, et cetera, for each study. And then an overall treatment effect is calculated through the weighted average of these summary statistics. So this is displayed in the form of a forest plot, which is a typical graph which is used for displaying the results of meta-analysis. It is basically a blobogram which gives in one glance the results of the study. So this is the uh, forest plot, which has the study IDs on one side, the intervention group, the control group, the small n is the, 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 the event, uh, the number of uh, people with the event, the big n is the total sample size. So uh, uh, same is the case with the control. Then this, there is a weight. What, what is the weight of each study to in the direction of evidence and the relative risk along with the confidence interval of each study. Now you can find that there is a there is a square here and also the arms. The arms indicate the confidence interval and the the uh, effect estimate of that study is indicated by the square. And uh, this is the the central line is a line of no effect. It is one for ratios, meaning the OR and RR will have one. Whereas the uh, the, uh, the, the absolute risk reduction and the mean difference will have zero as a line of no effect. Now you can decide whether uh, which side is the one which favors treatment or the experiment. And from here, you find out what is the final uh, uh, the take home message through this diamond. So the diamond represents the overall effect estimate. The vertical line through the vertical points of the diamond represents the overall effect. The horizontal line, when it passes through the diamond, it indicates the confidence interval. And if the horizontal line uh, uh, of the tips of the uh, diamond cross the vertical line, the combined effect is not significant. In fact, if any of these squares, if they hit the line of no effect, that means the results of that study are not significant in either of the direction. So meta-analysis software is freely available uh, in uh, any of these sites. Uh, I am my I am familiar with Redman, and uh, I, it is freely available for people to use both for Cochrane as well as non-Cochrane systematic reviews. And there are also the commercial and other general stats packages packages which are available. Now, uh, somebody was saying, do we have enough studies? This was a publication that we had done in 2015, and what we found was the contribution of Indian studies to the Cochrane meta-analysis and systematic reviews has increased from the early 70s, uh, uh, 80s to, uh, you know, this was since the paper was published in the mid 2015. As you can find here, there is a, a progressive increase in the number of good quality studies that are available are many. So it is high time that we also talk about the secondary studies, collate all the results and see that, you know, we are able to uh, have our own good systematic review data to develop the clinical practice guidelines. So I think we have, uh, you know, slightly we are going behind schedule. Uh, this was a small video to give a demo of how to use the Redman for, uh, you know, constructing the, uh, the the forest plot. So what I'll do is I'll very quickly run the video, not go through the uh, each point. Uh, so, uh, you know, this, this is the Redman software. Now, I was working on uh, um, the use of acupuncture for uh, insufficient lactation. So after entering all the studies, uh, you know, you can't uh, identify what is written here. It is taking a little time to stream. I just want you to see the construction of the forest plot 
which is very easy. So after you have uh, inserted the, uh, the title of your uh, study, followed by the kind of uh, uh, the, the statistics that you wish to enter. So then you uh, enter the inclusion, uh, the studies which are to be included in the systematic review. And after that, you input the data that is there in, uh, you know, at the right place in the software. And as you start inputting the data, you can find here that there is the, uh, the, the, the forest plot that is getting constructed. So it is an automated uh, software which helps you to construct the, uh, the, the forest plot, which is very easily done. And incidentally, as you can find here, here the diamond is right in the middle, meaning that the study, the, the interventions have not been of uh, great significant output. So, uh, so with that, I end my, uh, uh, my talk here. Thank you so much for the patient hearing. Uh, thank you, Radhika, for beautifully highlighting all the points. The talk was very clear. And uh, let me tell you that uh, if you have a systematic analysis, you know, it's easy to publish them in journal of high impact factor than the research paper. So it's worth investing your time in systematic reviews. So um, now mm -hmm. next uh, J person, Dr. Achila, you want to say yeah. something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank I you for think, the appreciation. I think I think it was a very, very interesting talk and very informative also. And I like the video which you've shown how you can easily make a forest plot that will help you know what you are doing uh, in that. So I think this uh, teaser which we have planned, I think it is going to interest many people and our purpose of doing this to get people who are actually interested in doing this work, then we'll take it forward. I think it was a very, very informative lecture. And like I, what I could get there was a systemic review is like doing a thesis you do. You have to Absolutely. go to the same steps what you do in a thesis when you're doing a research on something. The systemic review also is like that only. Just you have to know what to do and spend little time. And for definitely, even in a uh, research, whatever you do, it's a very good idea to have a statistician because that you have a you know, good study, to have a good study, a good statistician telling you about the sample size and things is required. Similarly, for a systemic review, for how many studies you should include, which studies, which data is correct, I think having a statistician should be a good idea. Thank there's you. One, uh, Achila, there is one question in the question box, um, Rachna has asked, that uh, is it uh, in systematic analysis, do they consider whether journal is indexed from where you're taking the study? Not at all. It doesn't matter. You, but the, what is important is that you should be able to appraise the literature well. So uh, if it is not uh, published in an index journal, uh, one needs to really see what was the reason, what was the, uh, you know, whether funding was the reason or whether the quality of study was not good enough for it to be published in the uh, good journal. So, Dr. Uh, Mittal wants to say something. Yes, madam. Yeah, uh, somebody said it's like a research. In fact, I was just saying that whenever you write a systematic review for Cochrane, you make a protocol with all those, as Radhika pointed out, two, three or four authors. And it's a proper protocol made like a research protocol, which again, the protocol goes for peer review. That particular research group, all members will review that protocol whether this is all right, are they really looking at the points which we need to look at? Are they, how are they taking care of bias? How are they taking care of other things? So it is a very, very systematic process. It's not that anybody and everybody can write a systematic review. Yeah. A, you need a training for that. Yeah, yeah it needs a training and it needs a lot of hard work. You have to go through tons of literature. And then you have to filter, you have to take out the shaft from the useful things. Then if you're discarding some articles, you also need to give reasons why you are not including them. Whether you think there is a bias or you think the evidence grade is low, the type of study is poor. In fact, somebody said, do we go by index journal or not? Most of the time when you are doing a literature search, you will be able to do search for index journal sometimes, or also, of course, some unpublished work or thesis 
published or thesis put in the library and all, but mostly it will be index journals only which will form. And already you have heard about grading of evidence. So it will not be an expert opinion or personal opinions will be considered much for systematic review. It will be more of what is evidence-based. Thank you, Madam. Dr. J.B., please. Yeah, I think uh, already uh, Dr. Mittal has already highlighted. Dr. Mittal had a lot of work on this. He's a, like, you know, Cochrane database, uh, Madam is a consultant there and we have been like, you know, trained by her. But Dr. Radhika did a wonderful job. I think she made the steps of uh, how to conduct systematic review so simple that even, you know, I, I think people who are not used to it, they, are, they also understood it. And Dr. Radhika is very, very keen. And Dr. Sunita Mitri is also there, then CMC Velour. So those who are actually interested yeah. in doing meta-analysis and systematic systematic review, I mean, they can basically, you know, undertake these uh, uh, training under her and, and I mean, the, there are methods available for that. But as she rightly said that she say, if it's a proven by a single study, if it's proven by, you know, simple RCT, it is just, it, it still won't go to the whole world. But once it is proven by systematic review or meta-analysis, then the practice will change. In fact, that is what happened in 92, you know, with this uh, uh, um, dexamethazone, beta-methazone trial, I mean, the henna and all, they did the study, they compiled the that on, on almost more than one lakh, you know, uh, uh, mothers where uh, uh, this steroid was given. So overnight practice was changed. And William Williams of Statics, I remember that time. You no, know, I delivered a talk actually on that, so I know ninety three or four. So even William of Statics wrote it that you know. Uh, 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 that we have to change the practice and the Ligins uh, studies from New Zealand were the highest factor which switched the pendulum toward the side of, you know, that it has proven efficacy. Same with this Hannah's breach trial. Overnight, no, basically like ultimately when they compile the data to change the practice all over the world. I mean, overnight, uh, 100 percent cesarean section rate went uh, in USA, UK, and even in India. Though later on, the, some studies had it were not so effective. So, so I mean, the defense was not so much also. So I mean, this meta analysis and systematic review is at the top of pyramid, as both speakers have highlighted. And uh, so we need, we can try that, of course. But you need to be trained in that. It's not that today only I can start doing it. But those who are interested can learn. But thank you very much. It was a real pleasure to hear. Uh, Antenatal steroids have been given so much of importance now with all this confusion going on that at the moment if you look at the insignia of Cochrane collaboration, the forest plot in the center is of antimetry corticosteroid study. Though Cochrane review is universal, not confined to Ops and Gynae, but still that graph makes the logo for Cochrane. Yeah. So thank you, Radhika, and it was a wonderful talk, and uh, thanks for giving us the opportunity, and thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Radhika, for that lucid talk, and especially the information about those softwares. <laughs> I, I actually like them. Thank you, all <laughs> the chairpersons, and uh, Dr. Sunita, ma'am, for your pearls of wisdom. Uh, we now move on to the next session. Uh, for the next session, I would like to invite the chairpersons. Our first chairperson is Dr. Manju Puri. Ma'am is Director Professor uh, at Department of Obs and Gynae and HOD of Lady Harding Medical College. Uh, she is uh, presently the chairperson of Safe Motherhood Committee of AOGD. And uh, she is the next president of Narchi Delhi chapter. Uh, Ma'am ma is member of Technical Advisory Group of India Newborn Action Program, Subject Expert Committee, Central Drug Standard Control Organization. She has edited three books and she has numerous publications to her credit. I welcome you, ma'am. Our next chairperson is uh, Dr. Vinita Suri. Ma'am is professor and uh, HOD at Department of Ops and Gynae at uh, PGI MER Chandigarh. And she's the program director of ICMR and WHO Collaborating Center for Research in Human Reproduction and uh, current president of AGOICC and FOXI uh, chapter of Northern India. Uh, she has numerous publications and she has done uh, various research projects. I welcome you, ma'am. Our third chairperson is Dr. S.N. Basu, ma'am. She is senior director and head at Department of Ops and Gynae uh, and Infertility Max Super Specialty Hospital, Shalimar uh, Bagh, Delhi. She is national coordinator of webinar teaching of National Board of Examinations, 
Delhi and National Representative of International Association for Communication in Healthcare UK, National Convener of uh, Development and Implementation of Curriculum of Communication in Healthcare, National Board of Examinations. Uh, she has multiple awards to her accolades and she has authored good clinical practice guidelines for the National Board of Examinations, Delhi. Uh, I welcome yeah. you, ma'am. So I invite now uh, Dr. Manjupuri, ma'am, to invite the, uh, introduce the next speaker. <laughs> Manju, please mute. Uh, <laughs> yeah, could you please share the uh, Manchu? Please share the CV. Shay, I was uh, can I introduce? Yeah, Dr. Nita, please. Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Divya. Thank you for your kind introduction, and thank you, Radhika, for giving me a chance to introduce my dear colleague, Dr. Joseph Matthew. I'm extremely happy to introduce Dr. Joseph Matthew, who's a pediatric pulmonologist at PGI Chandigarh. He's a national and international leader of the evidence-based healthcare movement. He's a member of so many organizations, you can read the slide. If in one line I have to introduce him, I will just say he's a star in the galaxy of EBM. And the best and the most proud contribution, what he has given to India is he's brought Cochrane to India. So last year, we inaugurated Cochrane India, which was already South Asian Cochrane Network. He's a founding member of this organization. And other than being an avid researcher, he's got more than 300 publications, which I saw on the net. He's too modest to tell us here. So he's a clinician par excellence. And on a personal note, I find him very warm, compassionate, and very humble person. Dr. Matthew, we welcome you. Now's the time after collecting and gathering evidence by two great lectures by Dr. Meena and Dr. Radhika. Now there's a time how to process this evidence into clinical practice guidelines. And Dr. Joseph is the best person for this. We welcome you, Dr. Joseph. Thank you very much, ma'am. It is so wonderful to be able to meet you online, even though we work in the same institution and you have been very, very kind. I must admit, uh, I am not the only founder of the Cochrane thing in India. It was founded by a joint group of about 15-20 uh, people. I was only one of those uh, people yeah. at that time in 2003. Uh, I also thank uh, you know this August Forum because I am the only kind of foreign body here who is not a specialist in the field of obstetrics or gynecology. And uh, listening to all these discussions, I am struck by how little I know about the kind of things that you do, both in terms of clinical practice as well as in research. And on a personal note, um, I'm very fond of Madam Vinita Suri. We have collaborated on several projects together and, and ma'am is very encouraging and always open to new ideas and things. So it's been a very nice thing. And I hope that I will be able to do justice in the next 15 or 20 minutes. Now, the topic that I've been allocated is the process of uh, clinical practice guideline formulation. And I hope the slides are visible. And this is a slightly tricky topic because everybody makes guidelines. And in the, the backdrop of this COVID pandemic scenario, we are flooded with guidelines actually. And everything that people do or speak is called a guideline nowadays. So I thought before we actually plunge into how it is done, I must just explain what exactly is a clinical practice guideline. And unfortunately, there is no single definition which covers everything that should be there. So I've made a definition which amalgamates points from three different uh, things. The first is guidelines are actually systematically developed statements based on the best evidence of the current data. I've tried to highlight the two important phrases here. They are systematically developed statements. They are not just statements which anybody can just get together in a room over half an hour or two days or one week. They have to be developed systematically. And obviously, they're based on the best evidence, which is why we're having this discussion today. But for what purpose? The purpose is to assist practitioners, which is healthcare providers, as well as patients, when they make shared decisions about the best healthcare for these patients. So it is not a one-way traffic in which a healthcare provider says, do this or don't do that. It has to be a shared decision-making. And these guidelines are statements which are assisting both these groups to come to a shared conclusion or decision. And how does that work? 
this comes from the third definition which is from the who because guideline documents contain recommendations now the fruit of a guideline document or the product of a guideline document is the recommendation so recommendations are the actual products which are of importance to both people who are practicing as well as people on whom the guidelines have to be implemented why these are important is because recommendations are statements not documents they are statements within the guideline document which tells the intended guideline end user which is either a healthcare provider or a patient what he or she can or should do or should not do this we are familiar with because all guidelines say do this don't do this and things like that what we fail to remember is that most good guidelines offer a choice between different interventions or amongst a bunch of interventions and ultimately it is the end user which is either the provider or the patient or jointly who have to choose from those multiple interventions to decide what is best for him or her so it's not just a rule it's not like a traffic light red means stop yellow means get ready green means go those are rules so guidelines are not rules they are actually to facilitate people who provide healthcare and who accept healthcare to arrive at an evidence based decision now how these things are formulated uh, first of all uh, i i must here confess that uh, the formulation of an evidence based clinical practice guideline is actually a cumbersome time consuming a very exhausting and intense process so it is not the thing that we are familiar with in which you know scientific society says okay you are the 10 20 experts come together over a weekend sit in some nice uh, hall for two days and by the end of the weekend you should have a document which is the guideline for our society or our country it doesn't work like that hmm? there are basically about 12 steps which i will just briefly highlight and the first and most important step is to deliberate on whether a guideline is needed so this looks like a silly question because obviously a guideline is needed that is why we are all experts sitting in a room but the issue is not who wants the guideline or who needs the guideline the question is why is a guideline needed if there are things which are straightforward they should be done then there is no ambiguity there there is no need to make a guideline on that for example ever since semelwise showed us that hands should be washed before patients are touched i think there is no need for the need of having a guideline to say that you know hand washing should be practiced or hand hygiene should be practiced or surgical procedures should be done wearing sterile gowns and stuff like that hmm? so things which are obvious there is no need of guideline so a guideline usually gets needed when there is uncertainty about something whether there are multiple options for certain ways of doing things or there is confusion amongst different practitioners or different healthcare recipients about what is the ideal or the best in a given scenario or situation that's when a guideline is needed to help people to come to the right evidence based decision then of course if there are already guidelines on the topic which some other scientific society within the same country or body has prepared then there is no need to replicate and say if a has done so b should also do so that is not required so i think a lot of decision making has to go to decide whether a guideline is actually required to be developed or created and once that is done then the rest of the steps uh, follow uh, the second step of course would be to form a steering group there is a lot of text on this slide don't bother to read ultimately the slides i think will get shared or photographs can be taken the main message is that the steering group is kind of an overarching body which looks after the entire guideline development process it is not just a you know set of very key senior people who just decide ki okay a will do this b will do this c will do that the entire process has to be mentored and monitored and facilitated by the steering group it might comprise four or five people who have got expertise in the subject as well as some expertise with how guidelines are developed and if i had to pick out one word from this busy crowded slide i think it would be oversight the steering group has to oversee the entire process right from framing the research questions to which answers are provided through the guideline recommendations right to the process of selecting the teams and doing the process and ultimately publishing the document then uh, the steering group should also deliberate uh, you know in great detail at length about the scope and purpose of the guideline what will this guideline cover what is the objective who is it intended for what health questions are being covered what stakeholders are going to be looking at this guideline all these things should be looked at because the very same guideline can have different meanings for different people and classic example is this antenatal steroids it may mean something for the obstetrician it may mean something else for the pediatrician who's there 
it could mean something else for a different set of stakeholders like the patients themselves. So this scope and purpose of the guideline is another preliminary step which needs to be looked at in uh, fair detail. And then of course, a steering group has to be finding an appropriate guideline development group. We call it the GDG. This is the people who do the heavy lifting, the heavy work in a guideline development process. They are the ones who help with framing the questions and actually the work is done by this group. Steering group kind of provides oversight. So these are the people who actually do the work. So rather than look at uh, what they do, it's more important to see who therefore should be in a guideline development group. And technical experts, I think that is obvious. And if you look at all the guidelines which have been framed in India, it's replete with people who are experts in the subject or who have key positions either in institutions or in associations or scientific societies. But it's important to remember that the end user who will use the guideline or implement the guideline should be a stakeholder from the beginning. Because very often a beautiful document is produced and then it goes down the chain to the end user who might be an ASHA worker at the you know, peripheral level. And then we find that that thing cannot be used because of certain limitations over there. So it's good to know who will implement the guideline and have some reps of them on the board of the guideline development group. Groups which are affected by the recommendations. These could be patient groups, these could be payer groups, these should be healthcare policy maker groups. Some representatives should be there on the guideline development. And then of course, key is to have methodological experts who understand how the process works, how systematic reviews of literature are done, and they should be the ones who actually should be on this. So it's a, it's a kind of a four-pronged thing. And uh, it, just like a four-legged stool, which we see in our OTs and all, you take out one leg, the whole thing collapses. So if you remove one of these experts or technical people, then the whole thing will uh, kind of collapse. Then the next step is conflicts of interest and declarations of interest have to be submitted by each person who is connected with the guideline development process in any way. And there are some formal definitions. Conflicts of interest doesn't mean only you know having received funding from a pharmaceutical industry. Anything which can affect a judgment or action or a decision which can unduly influence the process of guideline formulation, which is of primary interest to the group, should be called a conflict of interest or a potential conflict of interest. And the World Health Organization definition is it doesn't have to be only an actual interest, even if it is perceived to affect the individual's professional objectivity or independence, that would be taken as a conflict of interest. And the steering group decides you know, how this should be managed. If people are you know, very heavily conflicted, they might not be included in the guideline panel. If there are partial conflicts of interest, then there are certain sections of the guideline development process that they would stay out of. Because it's very important to know, you know what's driving people when they make statements, when they look at evidence and they synthesize evidence together. The next three steps actually would have been covered in the topic of systematic reviews. Uh, uh, they didn't get covered, so I'll talk, talk about them a little bit. All research is actually aimed to answer questions. Everything we do in research, if it's a primary research study, it is to answer a research question. If it is a systematic review, it is to answer a research question. If it is a guideline, it is to answer a question on what should be done or could be done. Now, most research questions in today's world are framed in this acronym called PICO, wherein P stands for the population or the patient or the problem, like women with anemia, pregnant ladies with anemia and things like that. I or E stands for the intervention or the exposure. So intervention could be like delayed cord clamping or whatever it is, or nutritional supplementation, etc. Every intervention or exposure is compared against something. And that comparison is always made explicit in these research questions in the PICO format. O stands for the outcome. And I have added a couple of other things which we use nowadays. T stands for the time frame in which outcomes are measured and S for the healthcare setting, if you like. So guideline development panel has to ask or generate a series of specific questions to which the answers will come from the literature if it is available. And then they become the inputs to frame the recommendations for a particular guideline. Once these questions are ready, then one has to do a systematic review of literature. And these definitions have been covered in Dr. Radhika's talk. Basically, it's a systematic process of searching for evidence based on certain criteria which are defined a priori. Each of those pieces of evidence which go into that uh, mix has to be adjudged for methodological quality. And then some kind of synthesis is done through meta-analysis or otherwise. It is almost like, uh, you know, if you are to prepare a good tomato soup, you can't just pick a bunch of tomatoes and dunk them into the kadai. 
you have to pick up each tomato, look at its quality, judge whether it is appropriate. If it is rotten, you throw it out. If it is good quality, meets your criteria for a good quality tomato, only those can go into the soup. Because otherwise, if you mix uh, you know, 20 good tomatoes and only three bad tomatoes, the net soup is vitiated or spoiled by the impact of these those three tomatoes. And in a tomato soup, you really can't remove the rotten tomatoes later on. Uh, whereas in uh, systematic reviews, you have the option of taking them out later on. But the right procedure would be to decide beforehand what should go into a systematic review of it. The eighth step is for each piece of evidence that goes into a guideline, we have to look at the quality. And uh, it's important to understand what we mean by quality. Quality is not the journal in which it is published. It's not the language with which it is written. It's not how good the bars and charts are, et cetera, et cetera. It is basically answering only one question. What confidence do I have that the author's statements as given in their paper is true? And that depends on the efforts that they have made to eliminate or minimize bias in their research methodology or the procedure which they've used to come up with that study. We know this very clearly. If the methods are bad, however impressive the result, it has no value. And I keep giving my colleagues this example. You know, students who are in classes 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, when they do physics problems or mathematics problems, of, and they get five or 10 mark questions, the teacher looks at the steps that they have followed to arrive at the final answer. If the steps are correct, say the first three steps are correct out of five, and then some error happened and the answer became wrong, the student still gets three marks out of five for at least re reaching part way there. But if all the steps are wrong and magically the answer is correct, that student gets a zero. So methodological quality looks at the steps which have been taken within research studies to minimize bias. And because guidelines are going to be depend on bunches of studies, we need to look at quality in individual studies. For each outcome that we are assessing, we need to look at quality across the studies which are contributing to that outcome. And then finally, we need to look across outcomes because for each guideline, there may be several efficacy outcomes, several safety outcomes, a couple of cost outcomes. So there are three levels at which we look at the quality to make sure that what is going in is a good quality tomato and not a rotten thing which will ultimately vitiate the whole process. And when we have got our evidence in place, the guideline development group tries to formulate recommendations. Recommendations are basically simple statements which, which are you know, couched like, we suggest to do this or not to do this. So the direction of the recommendation is either in favor of doing something, which is the intervention or the comparison, or against. So we recommend the use of antenatal corticosteroids. That's a direction in the favor of using the corticosteroids. And if it is a you know, guideline which is looking at beta-methasone versus dexamethasone versus some other steroid, then you can say we recommend using A or B or C. Or we recommend using any of these following corticosteroids, etc., etc. The strength of the recommendation is another issue which looks at two things. One is the level of evidence based on which this recommendation statement is being based. If it comes from a systematic review of high-quality randomized control trials, that is high-level evidence, as was shared in the very first lecture, sometimes we don't have that. So we have to make conditional recommendations that the strength of evidence which is contributing to this is a weak body of evidence, but yet we are making this recommendation. And ultimately, there has to be an examination of the desirable effects if the recommendation were implemented and the undesirable effects if this recommendation were implemented and the balance between the two has to be seen. The next step is, of course, to draft a document. I think we're all experts in pretty much like how any document would be drafted. There is an executive summary, a main body, and appendices, which have got all the details. Uh, all good guidelines go for an external peer review because the guideline development group and the steering group are standing so close to the whole process that they might miss something. So it's always good for an independent peer review. And you know, WHO and all take a lot of effort to do these peer review processes. And then, of course, once it's been peer reviewed, we make a publication and dissemination plan all good guidelines should be published, whether it is online or in a journal or circulated in other way, dissemination should be done. And these days, guidelines also have an expiry date. So two ways are there for giving an expiry date. Some good guideline development group says, we have done this now for the next two or three years, this is the guideline. Other guideline development groups would say that this is current and ready for use. However, 
if some big landmark studies came and changed all the evidence, then we might have to look at that again. This is one of the reasons that in the COVID pandemic, every few weeks or months, new guidelines keep coming about on the same issue, which we thought were done. So one day remdesivir is to be used, another day it is not to be used, the third day it may be used, and the fourth day it says it should not be used at all. So this is because the evidence keeps uh, so very quickly, this is the whole process. As a, as a body of experts in professional societies and leading institutions in the country, look at whether you need to form guidelines on certain topics and go through these 11 or 12 steps. Now, because I have been working with guidelines for a while, I suggest uh, that there is an alternate approach also which is possible. And that is much less painful and cumbersome. Rather than carrying that fetus for nine months and waiting to deliver it in the form of a guideline document, an alternate shortcut approach can be used, especially when the need is great and the time is urgent. And that is, your group of experts can frame a set of PICO questions. After framing the PICO questions, do an exhaustive literature to see whether there are already guidelines available which cover the topic of your interest. If they are available, see if they are current. So if they are very old and things have changed and there is no fun in using that. If they are current, Appraise the guideline and see if they are of good quality. There are tools and checklists nowadays to see if a guideline itself is of good quality. And these are freely available online. If it's a good quality guideline, see whether the PICO questions that you have developed match with the PICO questions that are covered there. And if so, then check and see whether those recommendations can be implemented. If the recommendations can be implemented, then a lot of labor is saved because you could pick up a guideline document, say, from some other body, in some other part of the world, but which uh, recommendations can be actually implemented in a local context. But if the answer is no to these things, that's when you need to consider developing a new guideline which is applicable to your uh, healthcare population. Now, if you do come across recommendations which are available from these existing guidelines, then one of two or three things can happen. One is you can adopt those recommendations as it is, which means even though they were developed for a different society, for a different setup, they are freely adoptable or copy-pastable or transplantable to our own society because we believe biology of the disease is similar, outcomes are going to be similar. And that is why even though no Indian trial has such contributed to the maternal steroids uh, thing, we are all following those recommendations. All resuscitation guidelines which we follow for... Uh, basic support, advanced life support, they're all based on Western studies. But we find that even though the population is different, the settings may be different, but they can all be implemented as it is. So it's like a copy paste. Read the guideline recommendations, make them your own, and say that you know your professional society endorses the recommendations produced in the guideline by, say, American Society of X or Y or Z. Sometimes, they cannot be directly transplanted or implemented, so they need to be tweaked a little bit or adapted. So adapting is like a nip and tuck procedure. So there are certain parts of the guideline which can be adopted as it is. Certain parts need modifications. And these modifications might be required because either the way the disease behaves in our population is different, or the way the healthcare delivery system has provided interventions is different, or there may be issues with monitoring, follow-up, and things like that. So you can have a recommendation in which you've taken parts of an existing guideline recommendation, but you needed to nip and tuck in an evidence-based manner to make them suitable for your own population. It's only if these two procedures fail completely that you need to go through the painful process of reinventing the wheel, which is to develop a new guideline. And that's a very time-consuming, cumbersome process, like I said in the beginning. And the risk is just like happens with this man who invented the wheel, you could get crushed under the wheel himself. So the process can be so, you know, exhaustive that people give up midway and say there's no point in developing the guideline. Let's just sit and have coffee over a weekend in some nice, uh, you know, institution. And by evening of Sunday, we will come out with some statements and that will be our guideline. It is better not to produce a guideline of that nature. And leave it. Don't have a guideline rather than have something. Why I say that is because primary research publications people may or may not read they are not going to be harm to the patient if people have not read. Systematic reviews people may read or may not read. They may or may not change their practice. If they don't change their practice, they don't benefit the patients, but they are not harming the patient. But guidelines, people will blindly follow. And if the guidelines have not been developed properly, the harm which is going to be caused to large quantities of patients and healthcare providers is something which we should be very much worried about. So better not to have a guideline than to have what is called a bad guideline. 
And my last uh, concluding remark is not related to the formulation of guidelines, but to remember that uh, you know having a good guideline and recommendation is of no use unless there is a mechanism to implement it. Uh, many of our professional societies take great pains to develop a guideline document and they call it the you know AAP document or IAP document or whatever it is in the context of your professional societies it may be the foxy guideline or something else but then we don't link it to implementation <clears throat> having a guideline but not bothering about its implementation is like having this half constructed flyover you know we've started the journey we're soaring up into the skies and then we leave it midway and we're not able to bring that thing down to where it is actually needed. So I, I think on that note, uh, I seem to have exhausted my time also. So I will uh, say thank you to everyone, especially the organizers. A thank you to the chairpersons as well, and everyone who's listened, and I'm happy to take questions if time permits. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Matthew. It was really mesmerizing, excellent, and explicit talk, sprinkled with humor also. I'm very happy, you know, you really you know, stressed these guidelines and should not be binding. <clears throat> Yes, right. And we should be able to change them according to our scenario. Yes. And another thing what I find is I will just like to make one comment. Youngsters, you know, in a strive to use guidelines, they forget the personal touch. Patient is nowhere in the guideline. They have to follow the guideline and they forget about the patient. I think that human factor should always be there whenever you want to use guideline. Thank you very much. Ma'am, thank you very much for bringing these very very, very important two points, which I kind of missed. Guidelines are not rules. They are not like traffic lights. Traffic light is a rule. Red means you're supposed to stop. Uh, yellow means you're supposed to slow down. When we start interpreting rules as guidelines, then problems happen. What yes. happens in India? When a yellow light comes, say, slow down, we accelerate because yes. we want to get out before it becomes red. That is risky. So guidelines are a set of tools which are meant to enable healthcare providers and patients to implement the best evidence-based decision in that setting. Yes. And sometimes it's not possible to do that. Yes. Other important thing which ma'am has so importantly highlighted is at the end of all this, there are people involved. There is a patient, there is a provider. We should not forget the patient and say, you know, we are following the protocol given by American Academy and they have said do this, this, yes. this. So we blindly do it. Uh, that is very, very okay. inappropriate and unfortunate. So thank you, ma'am, for, you know, uh, grounding us with these two important facts. Thank you, Dr. Matthew. It was a very, very uh, informative and a very, very, uh, very nicely flowing talk. And we thoroughly mm -hmm. enjoyed it. Uh, thanks for taking us through the insights of, uh, you know, how to uh, prepare guidelines. Uh, I feel that implementation is the biggest challenge. We already have uh, quite a number of guidelines uh, from government of India, but there seems to be a total disconnect between what is there in the guideline and what happens at the uh, you know, uh, frontline, uh, what the frontline workers do. So there's such a mismatch between the two. And recently we had tried to, you know, um, uh, make some uh, uh, tools uh, using AI. And uh, we could not because our uh, guidelines are absolutely, uh, you know, they are vertical and we had to integrate them horizontally. So uh, I think guidelines are required, uh, and but they have to be good quality. And I just wanted to know that other than the checklist, which you were saying, is there any fidelity test for uh, these guidelines? I'm saying, how do we understand as to uh, what quality are they? A, B, C, D, what? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Yes, there is, there is a checklist, which is called a tool, actually. It's called the AGREE 2. It's called only AGREE. It's an acronym for appraisal of guidelines, et cetera, et cetera. It is a standard tool. There are some other tools available online, but this one is regarded as the gold standard. The second important thing is if we read a guideline document, a guideline document which has not elaborately specified the process which was used, which covers those 12 steps that I talked about, that we have to be a little worry of. For example, if you took a good quality guideline document which comes from prestigious agencies such as NICE or WHO, then these procedures would have been discussed. Whereas if we look at guidelines which are formed by you know, individual hospitals or professional societies in other parts of the world, and they don't describe these procedures, then probably it is not worth reading. Just like if a research paper or a publication has not detailed the methodology used, we would not read the results no matter how impressive they are because the methods have not been clearly formulated. 
So these are some of the tips and tricks to decide which is a good quality guideline and which is not. Yeah, can I add a comment to uh, that? I think uh, Dr. Manju. Uh, so, sorry, Dr. Basa, please. Continue. No, I think uh, I would just like to, you know, compliment uh, all the speakers and Dr. Matthews for such a lucid talk, which has highlighted everything, uh, you know, about how to prepare guidelines. And the point that Dr. Manju made that even using artificial intelligence, you know, bringing them onto the horizontal or even implementing. The problem is that we have the whole range of healthcare, right from the tertiary care or above that to the level at the, you know, the primitive healthcare. And so the guidelines will never be applicable to the whole range. So I think we can probably only develop SOPs up to a certain point for this particular healthcare facility. And after that, they refer them to the higher facility. This level is, this point is more important than actually just making a guideline because they feel humiliated if they are not following the people as oh, the guidelines say this. They may not have the facilities. They may not have the expertise of doing, you know, so many of the things that we have put down in the guidelines. So I think we need to integrate uh, healthcare in a graded fashion and the guidelines should also be graded accordingly. I mean, that's you know, a practical thing that I have felt over a period of time with the implementation <laughs> of guidelines. Any suggestions how this can be overcome or we can work yes, towards it? Yes, ma'am. It's a very important point. And the reason this happens is we don't consider the end users of the guidelines when we are framing them. It's mm -hmm. like the document is prepared in New Delhi in Ashoka Hotel. And it has to be implemented in some, uh, you know, remote village in some place yes. where there is none of those things which are available. So two things are there which we can do. One is either we have to get representatives of the actual end users who are going to implement the guideline on board from the beginning or their representatives or somebody who understands the situation. There are among our professional societies, people who have worked in rural areas who will know. Just like, for example, no, in pediatric tuberculosis, we are struggling to make a national guideline implementable everywhere. And it is very easy to say in the guideline, do a man to test. But the people who have worked in the field, they say, we don't get man to over here. So what is the use of writing the guideline, do a man to test? So that will become, if man to is available, do it. If it is not available, use something else or don't do it. So that end user perspective will only come when we have some input from these people on board. Sometimes it's important to consult patients as well. In the United Kingdom, for example, the good quality guidelines are made by consulting patients. The reason is because certain things patients may not like. Uh, you, this is the story mm. told, no? That when the HIV pandemic was hitting all over the world and things like that, in Uganda or some African country, uh, people would not uh, agree to use condoms because the guidelines said women should insist that their male partners wear condoms. And some African countries adopted easily. In some African countries, it didn't fail. And the reason was that when female has to insist on male partner to use a condom, the male partner was suspecting female of infidelity. <laughs> so for that social reason, which nobody in the thing considered in the Geneva where the thing must have been made, that brings the whole thing down to zero. Guideline is absolutely robust. The recommendation is based on evidence because condom use prevents HIV, this thing. But implementation cannot be done. So these are some of the things which uh, can be done to look at uh, and then your point, ma'am, that we can have different gradings, which means if you are in this kind of a primary healthcare setup, then you can do only one and two. If you encounter the third thing, refer or teleconsult nowadays. If you are in a slightly higher level, then you do this and this. And ultimately, if you are in a medical college or a you know tertiary care center, then you do the full whole hog. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much for your, you know, input. Yeah. The WHO always insist that whenever you make guidelines, they have to be adapted by the country. You don't have to follow them verbatim. You have to adapt. They will say first to, as he said, implementation. But before that, you have to do adaptation to your own country and then implement in your country. And I'm sure initially also when you had when uh, Nina started or Radhika started, they said three important things in evidence base. Evidence is there, the person who is going to use is there, but 
at the same time patient is equally important it has to be to your own situation so that has to be kept in mind we can never forget that it is not something just text it has to be practical yeah i guess when the diversity of uh, india uh, the guidelines have to be national guidelines have to be adapted by the states uh, because uh, every state is different so i think that kind of adaptation does it happen dr mathi ma'am it is actually like this we imagine that you know a mercedes car manufactured in germany can go 160 kmph on their autobahn mm. so we import that car to india and then we find are ye to hamari city mein 40 se upar jata hi nahi hai but the <laughs> car is the same its engine is the same performance is the same what is changed is the road condition so that road condition which you need to drive at 160 kmph is available in certain parts of say new delhi in the lutians delhi it's not available in chandni chowk it is not at all available in the peripheral parts where the you go to the village when you reach the tribal and hilly areas there is no road at all so if we say that you know that mercedes has to perform 160 kmph throughout india uh, it will not happen so we have to adapt so where either we have to say this this will not work you have bring mercedes for lutians delhi then you ultimately come down to a tractor or a truck or something or a bullock <laughs> cart in the district the goal is to let's say transport patients or so i'm just giving you a very crude yes. example so yeah. transplanting something from a different setting and expecting it to work in the same way in another setting will be just like transplanting organs the recipient system where you're trying to transplant a guideline or recommendation will reject it just like mm-hmm. uh, you know you transplant somebody's heart into somebody else's the system will reject it and it will be a totally useless exercise so we have to always consider i think end user perspective who is going to implement the guideline on whom is going to the guideline be implemented and what resources or training or skills they have especially in in field of obstetrics and gynecology where there is hand skills involved because surgical yes. skills are not the same there is a learning curve and things like that so certain procedures which are done at a very high level of skill cannot be replicated by people with lower levels of skill even in the same hospital it may be say you know a tertiary care institution but when a, a consultant does it is not the same as a resident doctor or somebody else in the chain of command uh, do so these have to be factored in who is going I, to i have a small comment to make uh, you know we had this discussion whether guidelines should be adapted adopted or implemented acquired by all uh, unless we do that to a certain extent i don't think we are ever able to audit our practices we will never be able to go forward Uh, i still am failing to understand why our anemia burden remains so high we have tried every means of improving that it doesn't happen so uh, you know we we may not have a military regime sort of a thing but uh, dr basu really worded my feelings actually that is what i was trying to say that we have a very variety of healthcare inside delhi we have private slums public sector hospitals so we need to have that kind of a graded approach but we also need to see to some extent that these are you know implemented so that we are able to understand the practice and the lacuna that we are you know doing because now today it is total confusion everywhere we don't know what the other person is doing and there is a kind of secrecy involved in these kind of works you know that is not a good absolutely. idea absolutely yeah absolutely we yeah. have to be transparent in every way if the guidelines have to be transparent so <clears> should be <throat> the practice there there is there should not be anything to you know yes shy away from Yeah. yeah this is very important point in fact uh, you know covid guidelines are so many and so numerous uh, mm-hmm. in fact we took up a project with guidelines international network in the pediatrics community we started it we took out a bunch of guidelines which are implementable in india and we started asking pediatricians a few basic questions are you aware of this guideline are you already following this if you are not following this why not etc 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 and a lot of interesting information came out then i uh, discussed with dr radhika and requested her to run some covid guidelines related to pregnancy to you know circulate it within the larger community of obstetricians and gynecologists and uh, we got a few responses i think she will spread those things more yeah. it is an eye opener so very often the guideline is straightforward recommendations that people are not aware or they are aware and doing something else for certain reasons or they feel that there is you know kya farak padta hai that kind of a thing so it, it, once we identify the reasons why evidence based guidelines are not being implemented only then we can target you know how best to improve so it just anemia control may have some relation to this there may be issues okay. at multiple levels which we might be able to look at 
through a targeted uh, root cause mm -hmm. analysis. Mr. Matthew, you. you, we are doing a QI project on anemia control right in the tertiary care center, and it is fascinating. You know, some people think the 10 gram is okay, 9 gram is okay. You know, it is to that uh, level. Uh, you know, people are not looking at the uh, uh, indices. A uh, lot of time, you know, it is B12 deficiency, kuch nahi, you know. So it is very right. We have to understand as to why so, you know, this is in yeah. itself a QI project. That so between, we look at why they between, are not, uh, you know, uh, uh, implementing those guidelines and then rectify. I think that is the way forward. So between the guideline and the systematic review, you have something called a living systematic review, you know, like the way it started in COVID. Systematic reviews could be of different types. They could be rapid, scoping. There are various types. I talked of only the basic... So in the living, what they did was because the COVID, uh, so many experiences came. So it is a continuously running systematic review uh, where new evidences are added. And then, so we could have probably something in that direction with problems, you know, which we are facing. So we have a large area to be addressed, which we are. So that was the idea for the CME today. So uh, I, we just wanted to share our experiences and the thoughts and we need to get together and start working in that direction. No, it was wonderful, you know, wonderful CM and wonderful yeah. talks by all of them. Thank you so much for, you know. Yeah, the actually the basic, the basic idea behind this webinar was not to, you know, do it again for many people. We just want interested people who are really interested will get together and, uh, you know, uh, train them more and do something. No? Not that we want to do, just increase the number of webinars, do another one. No. From this, people who came today, we will ask the interested people, they can write to AOGD or Ringa Pradhika, and then we can do further, you know, small group uh, workshop or uh, go ahead. Yes. So we can invite Divya to conclude the session, I think. Thank you, ma'am. So this uh, uh, brings us to the end of this wonderful webinar. Uh, this is actually not the end, as all of us said. This is just a beginning. Uh, I thank Dr. Sunita Mittal, ma'am, for enlightening us for, uh, with her uh, gracious presence. I thank all the esteemed chairperson and learned speakers uh, for their valuable contribution to this webinar. I thank all the delegates who logged in. I want to th thank Dr. Radhika for conceptualizing this webinar. And thanks, Dr. Achla Batra, for all her support. Uh, last but not the least, I thank Shivam and uh, Himanshu from Conference International who were the, at the backend team for all the technical help. Uh, we will continue to bring uh, such, such kind of webinars in future. So uh, stay tuned. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Devya. <laughs> thank, thank you. It is nice. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so thank you all. Thank you so much.